Okay, so this slideshow is covering a lot of theater history, some really basic overviews of how we come to know theater history from the, from the east to the west, from ancient times up through what we would consider to be the beginnings of modern drama. Um, there's a lot of information in the textbook that is much more in-depth than these slides, but this gives you at least a point of reference. So we, we talk about the origins of theater. It's always connected to its past and to its future. If you think about art in general, art tends to rebel against itself and it goes with the flow of what's going on in society. You cannot study art history without studying history in general. Um, and so that's the same is definitely true for theater because theater is storytelling and what do we tell stories about? We tell stories about ourselves and what's going on and so we're going to be incorporating our past and our present and our future into our plays. So there's always a connection there into humanity. Um, the exact origins, however, of drama are unknown. It's really been going on, we think, as long as people have been alive because there's an instinct to always connect ourselves to our world and to feel a part of things, and so storytelling is certainly a really important way to do that. We do know that ancient foundations of theater include ritual and storytelling. So we'll talk a little bit more about how those were done. So when we talk about ancient theater, we have to go back to sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt, to the cradle of humanity, as we sometimes call that. Traditional drama began when spoken dialogue entered ritual in sub-Saharan Africa. So the first ritual to incorporate dialogue that we know of was shamanistic. So the shaman mediates the real and the spirit worlds and undergoes striking performances. This is the way that they celebrate and the way that they came to understand their place in the world. Theater then moved to Egypt. The Abydos Passion Play dates from 2500 BC. That sounds like a familiar number when we talk about Western theater as well. Um, resurrection drama is rooted in a springtime ritual. So these kinds of ritualistic things were going on a long time ago. So then when we move towards the West, we talk about Greek and Roman theater. Um, the origins are definitely in religion, again, as a way of understanding our place in the world. Performances evolved from Dithyrambos, uh, which was a drunken fertility ritual, a way that people um, paid homage to the god, to the gods, and to where they came from, and, and making sure they understood that. This produced bo both dark, bloody tragedy and body outrageous comedy, and it really laid the groundwork for all Western drama. Any sitcom that you watch on television, I guarantee you, is rooted in Roman comedy. So it's really kind of amazing when we look back at that. And ancient Roman theater was actually more famous for its architecture than its plays, and that's really because we just don't have a lot of the existing plays anymore. They were, a lot of them were burned when the library in Alexandria was burned in Egypt, and so we just don't have a lot of, a lot of scripts left over. Um, there's a few, and Shakespeare used a few of them in some of his plays, but there's just most of them are gone. Um, we say we can say this as a derivative of the Greek model. Um, it transferred from Greek over to Rome, and then they took a lot of the same ideas. And it had a profound effect on the Renaissance playwrights, because when you think about what the Renaissance was, it was a rebirth of art due primarily to the invention of the printing press. And so when the printing press was invented in Italy in the 1400s, all of a sudden these ancient stories, which only had been transcribed by hand by rich people, was now being mass produced. And so these ancient, ancient texts in the Renaissance are, have a rebirth and they're distributed widely and Shakespeare got a hold of them and he said, oh, this is great stuff, I'm going to write a bunch of plays now. And, and so the Renaissance really took off because of that. Okay, so then when we move into the medieval, when we talk, not move into, we talk about the medieval and Renaissance, which call, kind of followed closely on the heels. Um, when you go back a little bit to the Dark Ages, the 1100s, the 1200s, you're talking about medieval theater. It was intensely religious. Everything was run in Europe by the church. And in a lot of ways, it was illegal to do theater for any reason except for religious purposes. So theater emerged from liturgical elaborations known as tropes. The quem caritas is, uh, resembled a dramatic structure. So a lot of the religious texts, which are great, ways of telling stories uh, were very much following this dramatic structure that Aristotle had laid down. 
And then when the Renaissance came along, like I said, with the printing press, there was interest in classics, new expansion. This was a sense of exploration personified by Shakespeare. He really took off with it. And this was an age rich with dramatic flourishing in England, Italy, Spain, and France. So all throughout Europe, you're starting to get a rebirth of these ancient texts. And so the religious model set up in the medieval times um, was kind of forgotten about. And the kings decided, you know, it's, it's okay to move away from the church. And so they started making up new rules about what theater was for. And this really expanded. And then Italy, for example, created Commedia dell'arte, which is an influential form of improvised comedy. All different kinds of art forms were springing up because of the Renaissance. Then as we move towards the 15th, 16th, 1700s, you get the royal and the romantic periods. After the Renaissance, the royalty became really integral to the dramatic process. They were during the Renaissance as well, but they really took hold of it and, and made it their own as patrons and artists themselves. In France, for example, Moliere exemplified the spirit of the age. He created ingenious satirical comedies. You're going to read one of them. You're going to read Tartuffe, which is an old play, but it still resonates very well today. Um, it's about religious hypocrisy, which of course is very prevalent in our society all over the place. So we can really see how Moliere um, used satire to make fun of the royalty, <laughs> and which sometimes they liked and sometimes they didn't, but that's something that he did. Um, and he also made fun of just the upper classes in general. Spain's theater celebrated honor and philosophy, if you want to think of it that way. Spain was very rooted in, in honor. Um, England, the restoration drama rose, and the book goes into a little bit more detail about what that means. The restoration was basically a time in which um, there was a dark period in which one of the kings was thrown off the throne by the Puritans, and they said, no more drama, no more theater. For about 60 years, there was no theater um, that was legal. And then when Charles II was restored to the throne, which is why we call it the Restoration, um, drama exploded again and became very, very fun and frivolous and celebrated by the royalty again. So it kind of went back and forth um, as far as what the king's role was in drama. When the kings were on the throne, it was very well supported. If they were overthrown, then things got weird. Romantic theater followed the royal age by repudiating its ideas. And so again, theater's rebelling against itself. It's saying, okay, royalty is involved and they're writing everything that they want to write, but you know, oop, sorry, skipped ahead. Um, but instead, let's focus on emotion and individuality and let's be romantic about the human spirit instead of having it dictated to us by these upper class people being paid for by the state to write these plays. Um, let's make them a little bit more romantic and idealistic about individuals. So that's a really quick overview of that 500 year period. Um, now, at the same time in the East, we're going to look at some overlapping things that were happening. Um, Asian theater developed largely in isolation from the West. There wasn't a lot of crossover, as you know, because there wasn't a lot of travel available between the East and the West. And Christopher Columbus, for example, couldn't figure out how to get to India and all those things. So there was really two completely different hemispheres going on in terms of this art form. So we really do have to talk about them separately. So when we talk about Asia, um, we're talking about Indian drama as old as the Western traditions, so the same time period, just completely isolated. Sanskrit dance and drama is the oldest form that we know of. The, the Natya Satra, I'm not pronouncing that right, um, lays out its principles. This is basically the equivalent of the poetics. It was written about the same time that Aristotle wrote the poetics, a little bit later actually. But this was a document that said, you know, this is what art form should be like and this is what the structure should be like. And so, again, the culture, even though they had no idea what was going on in the West, they still had this innate human need to tell stories and to figure out how to do it in a structured way so that we can really guarantee that this is a, an instinct that humans have. Um, the Katkali, for example, is a sung performance accompanied by music. This is a style. Um, music was very integral to the Eastern philosophies and the Eastern performance. Um, there were two ancient epics that are, that are integral to Eastern culture. 
the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So these ancient epics are going to be told in a style. And these performances were very long. They tended to last 10 or 12 hours. Um, and people would, it, it was a festival. People would go and they would bring their their food and they would bring things to sleep on and they would hang out and they would just, it would be kind of like going to Woodstock, you know. But they would go and they would celebrate these performances with these people and this was just something they did in their culture. Then when we move towards China and Japan, we can get a little bit more specific. Um, this is moving ahead a couple of centuries, several centuries actually. When we think of Chinese opera or shisu, um, it originated as a comedic dance. Later it developed into stately and poetic form. Uh, there's over 300 variations of this. If, when you think about the Eastern philosophies, particularly in China and Japan, you tend to think of, you know, um, discipline. Discipline is a very big word in um, Japan, and, and if you think of any kind of martial arts, there's definitely a very, very ancient discipline involved that is handed down from generation to generation. And so if you are a performer, for example, you're going to come from a long line of performers, and it's a profession that you learn from a very early age, and you study, and you study, and you study, and you have a, there's a very big hierarchy as to when you can be a certain kind of performer. And so it's much different than in America. We can just go and audition for a play, and it doesn't matter who we are. But that's definitely not true in the East, even today. Um, for example, Japanese no, is pronounced no drama, is precisely performed and ceremonial. It deals with the supernatural. It's very, very stately. There's a, uh, some people call it the art of walking, because there's a very specific style that you have to walk and things that you have to wear and it's all very programmed out. Um, it's all very precise, similar to how martial arts is very precise. Um, so that's one type of drama in the Japanese tradition. There's also kabuki, which is much more um, circus-like if you were to equate it to something that we're familiar with. It's developed as mass entertainment. It's lots of spectacle, lots of really bright, wild costumes, lots of animals jumping around, and lots of acrobatics. As compared to the no, then, it's it's much more flamboyant, whereas no is much more stately. So you can think of it that way. Um, and rather than de dealing with the supernatural, its events are rooted in the material world. There's another form that's not on here that your book talks about, and that's bunraku. Bunraku is a Japanese puppet style that um, is very disciplined as well, and those stories tend to be common stories that people from Japan would know, um, but they're done with puppets, and so you actually have three puppeteers per puppet. You have one puppeteer controlling the right hand and the head of the puppet, and that is the master puppeteer who's going to be have, having studied for at least 30 years in order to get that position. The other puppeteer, um, the second one is doing the left hand, um, and the third one is doing the feet. And so it takes, it takes a lot of teamwork and it takes a lot of discipline and a lot and a lot of training to be able to do this puppet style. So that's a basic overview, really quick. 2,500 years of history in the East and West, and refer to your text for the rest of the information for the quiz.